Does anybody not have one? Yours is a half page. Um, go check and see if you can. Oh, you got two, Brother Ben? Okay. Or find him. Find Brother Rick or over here too. Hey. Right here. I need another paper. What would I be pointing at? <laughs> well, no. Okay, go in your Bibles tonight to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. So what do we do on Wednesday nights? Is this just being recorded or is it live streamed? It's being recorded. Okay. So when, I'm, when I want to talk to you without them, I'll do that at 7.30 or 7.35. Okay. Headlines of interest. I, uh, I saw a headline the other day. I almost brought it out here too. It's a Reuters story. And it's about the, um, it, it, it ran three or four or five days ago. And it's about in Gaza, the Palestinians raising up a team of archers on horseback. And it was about them wanting to compete internationally. I didn't know they did that, but there are people, I guess, who actually ride horse, shoot their bow and arrow. But I thought it was interesting because in Ezekiel 38 and 39, you read about God when he's speaking of the invasion of Israel by Gog and Magog. You read of the horses and riders and the bow and the arrow. And, of course, many people say, well, what that means now is modern implements of warfare. But maybe it doesn't mean anything but what it says. So I thought that was an interesting headline. You can find it out there if you just look up Archer and Gaza Strip. These are, uh, it was limited to that part of Israel, national Israel, where Gaza's on the, the western part of the nation. I thought that was an interesting headline. You've seen other headlines, though. That one didn't cause me to be frantic, some of what we're seeing today can cause us to be frantic, right? COVID, of course. I don't know if you're following South America, but Brazil, if India wasn't getting all the headlines, it would be Brazil and it'd be saying the same thing. Of course, Israel. Now, when you think about Israel and all those rockets coming in from Hamas, I was telling Sister Pam earlier what you don't read about because they don't really want this to be known, but when there's an escalation, Israel's response is fast and furious and direct. But it's not just what you see of their, their fighter jets dropping bombs. They have spe specific people in Hamas that they have followed and marked for years. And so when the least escalation starts, they'll take out the top 50 or 100 Hamas leaders just like that. And so they're not always against these because it allows them to reset. And the reason they keep expanding territory is because every time there's a conflict like this, the other side has fewer people to populate that territory. I'm talking here in a little bit of terms that I don't want to be too direct, but, uh, and, and I'm not saying that everything that Israel does as a nation is greenlit because it's Israel. You, you, I'm not the politician. I have to answer to God for me. I understand that we, we support Israel. We stand behind Israel because of the blessing and the connection to Abraham. Does that make sense? All right. So, but what else? What, when you see a headline, what's been troubling you the last week or two? What, what are some of the headlines that have caused you to have anxiety? Did you go get gas in your car today? How many of you filled up in the last three days, even though you were only down one half of an ounce? <laughs> okay, so there's one right there, right? Isn't it funny that uh, lots of people in America say, we don't want pipelines. Stop all the pipelines until a pipeline stops. And they say, turn the gas on. Turn that gas back on. <laughs> pipelines are good things, right? <laughs> Oh.
So tomorrow, if we find out there's a ransomware attack against the power grid, and you're going to be without electric for three days or three weeks, unless you pay a $2 billion ransom. Brother Steve? Domin or, uh, colonial. They did what? Or they didn't have a guy, huh? We don't need that. We're a pipeline. Pipelines don't need technology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very, very interesting. That's a, it's a huge deal, Brother Crable. Huge. I told Sister Pam an hour after I saw the headline, um, what day, like Friday or Saturday last week, this is a big deal. This is a huge deal because the, the cyber people say, well, you have five days to pay us. I don't even know what the ransom was, but the uh, company said we're not paying it. And the federal government said, well, maybe we should. <laughs> uh, now, the idea of finding these people, holding them accountable, because we've been seeing warnings about this for two or three years. This has happened in small cities, municipalities. Their infrastructure, their corporate or city office been held hostage, uh, cyber hostage, and they say, listen, we want 250000 or or $5 million or whatever, but this is being ramped up. And I read an article a few weeks ago that um, I forget two, three, four years ago when the U.S. discovered that Russia, not a, not a group within Russia, but the Russian government, my understanding, I may be misquoting it, but generally, that they had found all kinds of access points in our electric grid. What we did was put all the same kinds of things in their electric grid. So if the power goes out here, we may just have to live with it and be secure in knowing the power is going out there too. <laughs> I don't know how that's supposed to make us feel better, but it's a different world, isn't it, today? Yeah. What else? What's another headline or, or event? Yes, ma'am? Um, me oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about the headline the other day that the Federal Reserve was trying to, trying to keep the U.S. from defaulting on the national debt? Did you see that? It didn't make much in the way of headlines because that puts them in conflict with the administration who's saying, let's borrow more money. And China is saying at the same time, well, we now have a Bitcoin-type digital currency of our own, a digital yuan, and we could move the entire world onto that. It would be secure and safe, and it doesn't represent all that debt. I told you a couple of years ago that when Facebook announced their foray into Libra, the um, digital currency that they were trying to bring about, uh, they knew that that's where the future was. They just couldn't get it out there fast enough. They were trying to bring all the legitimate players in. Bitcoin bypassed all the legitimate people right after all the drug money and all the trafficking money. It's all, that all flows through there, or much of it does. And so Facebook is still trying to figure out how to do the, the Libra without having MasterCard and Visa because they said yes and then they backed out. It's a crazy world. COVID and digital currencies threaten the sovereignty of multiple nations. You take a nation of 5 or 10 million people, some of these smaller nations, that's it. They've, when they lose a currency, they've lost their sovereignty. And if they lose a quarter of their population, these are um, headlines that can really stir us up. Anybody else? Something, a topic or headline that... Sister Donna. Oh, what's being taught in public schools? That's a big deal, too. That really is. Um, it, it's just unsettling for kids and families, you know, to try and figure out, well, why isn't it important to have a basic education anymore? Why do we have to do so much social education or values education? Well, I don't have answers to any of this. 
So, <laughs> tonight, in the middle of your pager, you see three critical needs you and I have in these times. Tonight, we're going to talk about the first one, calm and peace, living life without worry. All right, so you're in Hebrews 3. Uh, we're going to read that last verse of chapter 3. It's verse 19, because that sets up chapter 4. So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter into his rest. Now, what happens to us sometimes as humans is we focus on one thing to the exclusion of the other. Or we identify with something and we miss what the Bible might be emphasizing. So you have two options here. You can focus on their unbelief, but if you do that, you miss the emphasis is on God's rest. But because we understand the unbelief, it so easily strikes us, oh, they had unbelief, and boy, I hope I'm never that way, or I know I was just that way the other day, and we miss the emphasis. So we're going to watch this in chapter 4, how the emphasis is on what is God's rest? How do you get there? Don't pay attention to those who have unbelief. Don't worry about those who have unbelief. So everything we mentioned involves a lot of people who have unbelief. Now, I have no doubt that there are believers working in the pipeline industry and, and fuels and all that. I have no doubt there are believers. I know believers, good, spirit-filled believers who work in public education and all the other, we know, spirit-filled believers that live in Israel. And uh, there are spirit-filled believers who are living in Israel who are not Jewish, who are Palestinian, Arab. Do you remember years ago we had that guy here a couple of times that played the, the oud, that gourd-like guitar, and he grew up in Israel. His family lived in Israel, but they were not Jewish. They were Arab. Okay, now look at chapter 4, verse 1. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. Oh, okay, see, that's a little bit more modified now. Verse 19 of chapter 3 is kind of a, you know, the, the lowering of the hammer, so to speak. But now we have a help, an idea that the focus is on rest still being available. The promise of rest is still good. It's still valid. It's still standing. So we ought to tremble with fear. He's writing, or she, hey, from now on, we're going to assume that the book of Hebrews is written by Priscilla. Sister Sherry got us into this at the business meeting in February, and it has reverberated through the halls of this church. And you know, I looked at my New Living Bible, and I don't know how I never saw this, but it says in the introduction who the author of Hebrews, and it says unknown. Some think Paul, some Apollos, some Barnabas, Luke, or... And there she is, right there. Boy, I'll tell you what, that Sister Sherry got us going, huh? So we're going to understand that Priscilla's writing from a position of possession. And she says, my greatest fear is that others might not, any believers might fail to experience the rest. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listen to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest, even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. We know it is ready because of the place in the scriptures where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. But in the other passage, God said they will never enter my place of rest. All right, so here's your first fill-in-the-blank, right? It requires what? 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 Yeah, belief. Belief or faith. You can use the word faith there. Hebrews uses that word so often. I don't know that they're always interchangeable, but pretty much. Faith, belief. So let's kind of work through this a little bit. What are we believing in? What, just very generally, based on our text here, uh, as well as other things that we know, what are, we, what are some of the things that we're believing in? Obviously, we believe 
The rest is available. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, absolutely. We believe that, you're right, that's where it all begins. We're reading this because we believe the Word of God is His Word, His promise to us. We believe that it's alive, that that promise has life-giving power. And so in saying this, Priscilla is encouraging us to come into something more than just the church building, to come into something more than just a religion, to come into something more than saying, well, my grandparents went here, I didn't have anything else to do, I know that in the summer they serve food, I, I like being here because there's a, a social, no, you've got to come into more than just a social atmosphere, you've got to come into what God's offering, and we do that through belief. Right? And we'll talk in a little bit about the benefits of that, but generally tonight, what we're talking about as a benefit is rest. And that rest, I'm going to say tonight, is somewhat interchangeable with peace. And one of the things that's happening all around us is the, the, the circumstances. The reality that we used to know is unstable, and so it's hard for us in our senses to have any peace. So if you remember when COVID started almost a year and a half ago, the thing I encouraged you about was prayer. Hey, if this becomes or when this becomes a pandemic, do you know how to pray? So we're going to be focused on that some through the rest of this month, here on Wednesdays, but also this coming Sunday, and just understanding what it means to go into that place, not with anybody else around. And when you're troubled, not just when you're confident or comfortable, you can listen to worship music or good preaching on, on uh, we used to say t- tapes and then CDs, and what do you say now, on your, on your phone or ear pods or whatever. But at some point, you're going to be faced with a boss or a coworker. You're going to be faced with a circumstance or a situation, your kid's school, your parent's job, or, or the nursing home or the hospital or what. There's going to be something that's going to threaten your peace. And then you got to go inside. It can't be her worship music or, or Carrie Job or who. you got to go in to the Holy of Holies yourself and find that peace. And that's what Priscilla's talking I like saying that, Priscilla. That's, <laughs> this is life-changing for me. You know, it took three months, but I've made that. You've seen it. I made that complete switch. It's kind of strange at first, but I did some research on it, and they think this might have been one of the first, if not the first, book in the New Testament actually written. So what you're looking at is the person who laid it down first. And when you think about it, the idea that we are leaving Judaism, we are leaving the Hebrew ideology, and we have entered the faith, it makes sense then, doesn't it? Because this whole thing's an argument against the law and against everything that came with the law. And boy, how cool is that if it's a lady, one of our sisters, that put it down, huh? Amen. <laughs> okay. This requires faith or belief, all right? Uh, what else do we know about coming to this place? Uh, when, when, there in verse 4, we know it's ready because of the place in the Scriptures where it mentions the seventh day. How else do we know? that God has promised us a place of rest, not in the future, but now. How else, what are some of the other things that help us to know that? Meditation, contemplation, experience, right? Our experience with him. Yeah, right. What else? Did you use the word confidence, Sister Linda? Yes. Yeah, confidence is critical, right? And that confidence comes from all the things we're talking about. Our time in his presence, our time with other believers, those moments when we were encouraged in a battle, we look back and we say, he brought me through that, he'll bring me through this. Okay, let's look at the uh, next section here. And I want your participation, but I'm also going to keep us moving a little bit quickly because we're going to do this whole chapter in the next 10 minutes. Uh, verse 6, so God's rest is there for people to enter, 
But those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. Now, again, I know this is the New Living Translation, but notice the connection she's making between what the Old Testament people did and what they had heard. They heard the good news. The promise of rest is good news. Now, that's the phrase that we find throughout the New Testament concerning the gospel. So when we say the Old Testament church were not wrong, when we say they had the opportunity, the promises, a little bit different, yes, but they still had access to God. And she, if this is Priscilla, says they heard the good news, they failed to answer. So God said another time, how good is our God, right? That gang failed to enter. He set another time for entering his rest. And that time is when? Ah, surprise, today. God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted. Today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Now if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there's a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fall. Okay? So in this context, 6 through 11, what do we recognize cuts off the rest or our access to the rest? There you go. Disobedience. Yeah, you can see it there, right? The New Living actually lays this out. That's the, you know, what I took was kind of their paragraphs because they see in those paragraphs certain themes, and I saw them as well. To get the rest requires faith or trust. I like that word trust. I meant to bring my board out here, and I forgot. Okay, if I had the opportunity tonight... Maybe I I don't know if you all won't be able to see it, but let's say I took, and I won't even write it because you won't from where you are. Um, Let's say I took the word um, universe first, okay? So we're going to talk about the universe. Do you believe that God is in control of the universe? And your answer would be yes. Do you believe that God is in control of the solar system, the one that you live in? You would say yes. Do you believe that God is in control of the planet Earth? And I'm putting an E for Earth. Yes, you do. Do you believe he governs the Earth? Yeah, not even a bird falls, right? Do you believe that he is in control of the nation of America that you live in? Yeah. And see, what we're doing is it's so easy to say, well, of course God governs the universe. Of course he's in control of the universe. But we're going to get all the way down here, and I would write the word universe real big, and then solar system smaller, and then... Because you know what we're heading down to? Do you believe that God governs your life? Then you go back to that first word, do you trust that God governs your life? And that's the challenge for us when we see things that are personally full of upheaval or nationally or internationally full of upheaval. The challenge is, do I still believe that God is in control of my life so that no matter what happens, I'm okay with it? (laughs) Right? Do you know there's some stuff going on in the universe? Have you seen those studies they've done the last few months on black holes and they found a black hole that's closer to the earth than they ever knew before? It's only a few light years, a few million light years or something away. And, uh, right, sustain me all those. I mean, this is amazing. But they see all this stuff, this and that's happening in the universe and this. And we've got some little tiny explorer that got out of our solar system in the last few months. I don't remember what it was called. It was sent out in the 1970s, I think. And there were two of them. And the one little guy, they think, is beyond the solar system. Whoa. But there's all kinds of inter- interactions with planets and stars and galaxies. And there's billions of galaxies just in our galaxy and blah, 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 blah. And does any of that bother you? Somebody's taking care of it. But if all the pumps were closed down at Sheets today, (laughs) see the difference? And this is where we're getting challenged. And God says, listen, you got to trust me. I know. I'm sure it looks terrible. I'm sure that you would love to be me, not like to take care of the whole universe. You just want to be me to take care of your part of the universe. 
And what are we trying to do? We're trying to avoid pain and suffering. And we struggle because when pain or suffering comes, we say, God, where are you? What did I do wrong? How did I get to this point? Did I deserve this? What have I? But God's saying, wait, don't get sideways here because the rest remains. It's still there. I'm still in control. And for people of faith down through the centuries, gang, you can read the church fathers, mothers, the great names and history in the church, and all of them, this is what it came down to. Those that we most respect that had those deep walks with God is coming to that place where no matter what happened to them, they trusted God. Right? Right? Mm. And when we just broke that down and discussed it in another kind of word study on it, it actually was representing that God is guarding over us. Mm. Amen. Somebody else tonight. Free will of man versus the sovereignty of God. I may not fully agree with what you just heard. <laughs> and we're not taking one scripture, we're taking one chapter. <laughs> yeah, and that's the pull of our faith with God, really finding that, that spot, that balance. And there is a part that is us, and, and she's saying that here again and again. They didn't choose to enter into the rest. They didn't choose to obey. So absolutely, there's a responsibility that we have. But I also want to make sure that you understand as believers that when you're doing that, don't then say, but I thought things would work out differently. Of course you did. All of us do. And if they'd have worked out a different way, you'd still say, oh, I really thought that. But it's life. We don't know how else it would have worked out. This is the way. And so God says it's not because you always made the right choice in daily decisions unless you understand that the choice that you made each day was me. When you make me the choice, obedience to what I want, to my word, living, then you can be assured, you can rest assured that no matter what happens, I've got you. You can trust that. Let me give you a testimony. No, I don't want it on. Uh, I don't want it on camera. I'll do it in a couple of minutes. Okay, come on. We got to get done with this. Twelve. Uh, t- uh, or no, uh, six through eleven. Yeah, let's do uh, twelve now. Uh, verse ten. So what are we resting from in verse ten? It says, "For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors." Yeah, labors are doing things our own way. Labors are worrying. Being anxious, those are all labors, right? And you can add, I'm sure, a dozen or a hundred others, but we're to rest from our labors and trust that God is at work. When we are praying and fasting, reading our Bible, spending time with him, when we're building up ourselves on our most holy faith, then we can, we can quit worrying. Things are not always going to work out the way we want them to. We are not God, but they are going to work out, and they're going to work out God's way for us. 
Your flesh will never like that, never believe that. Your flesh will war against that and resist it at all times. But it's the truth. And coming to the place where you can put down the flesh and rest in this is okay. That's, that's God's will for us. Okay, now let's pick it up in uh, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. I didn't write 13 there, but I meant to. And nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. He is that one. So here now we find out in verse 12 that there is a hindrance, and that hindrance is... I'm going to pick it up that his spirit discerns between joint and marrow and it exposes our innermost thoughts and, yeah, our desires. Our thoughts and desires are hindrance. Now, I know that the Bible says, seek him and he'll give us the desires of our heart. And some have interpreted that to mean that he'll change our desires so they line up with him. I I agree with that. I also agree with sometimes he'll give us the desires we want. But irregardless, when we talk about desires in general, desires that don't originate with God or we don't recognize that they don't line up with God's will for our life, they become a hindrance to us. And and we can be confident that they are exactly what needs to happen. I need to win that lottery. I just need to find that ticket of whoever already won it and didn't turn it in yet. This is bothering me. Who would have $730 million and not turn it in? I'm troubled. Do they not know my address? These desires of ours, and there are hundreds maybe every day or every week or every month, I don't know. And they can at times be so uh, firm in our mind and we're so confident of them. But it's like I said Sunday morning, you can have certain desires when you're 18 and those desires aren't there when you're 80. Now I'm not 80 yet, but you know what I mean? Our lives change. What we're going through vocationally. Some people all say, I think most of us have said this at some point in our life, I hope I find out what I'm going to be when I grow up. Uh, or somebody will say, well, I don't know yet what I'm going to be. And that's because even if you've done something for 10 years or 15, things can change and, and, and our circumstances change. Our bodies change. Everything's changed. But those desires can become a hindrance. What do we do instead? What should our desire be? Who do we have to make our desire? Yeah, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We've got to make him. You have to force that. That's not a natural, even as a spirit-filled believer, you still have to tell yourself every day, he's the desire of my heart. And then you've got to do things that confirm it. And when you speak it and act upon it, it will eventually come true. It doesn't work the other way. You don't see him as so wonderful, marvelous, lovely, he's so full of power, resurrection, love, deliverance, chain breaker, healer. You don't see him that way and then say, well, you're, you're the desire of my life. You speak it. You do things that demonstrate the truthfulness of that. And then there comes a breakthrough and you say, wow, I do see him that way. Well... Excuse me, that's the good news. Okay, here's the final thing. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit. In verses 14 through 16. So then, since we have a great high priest. Now remember, she's talking through this season here. These these verses, this chapter 3, and especially all of 4. About the rest of God. Resting in the Lord. His rest that he offers. So then, since we have a great high priest who's entered heaven. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. Notice, early in the church's history, she's using such terminology that the Jewish people would understand. This high priest, forget the earthly high priest. You've got this high priest. 
He understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There, will, there we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. We must, two words there, we must, verse 14, hold firmly. Amen. And what does, she, what does she say about Jesus? He, in verse 15, he understands. That's a powerful word. He understands and will give us, yeah, mercy. He will give us mercy and we will find, we will find grace. Now, I sometimes tease with you about the sovereignty of God because I'm trying to move myself to where, and I've been doing this for about 10 years, to where I don't, I don't have very much focus at all on my walk with God. I focus more on God's walk with me. And that's all I focus on. Because I want to be calm. When we were in Pakistan, I, uh, especially the day of the biggest event, I said that morning, you know, we were talking about this and this, and they had been out the night before doing a bunch of uh, street outreaches and, and uh, neighborhood ministry and skits and all that. And um, I said, listen, my only focus today is staying calm, just remaining calm, not focused on anything but me staying calm. I don't know if you've seen that picture that's taken from behind me, but it's really the view that I had. And when you look out and there are so many thousands of people, you can't see the end of it. And I knew then, uh, Pastor Ash and I were talking, we knew we were over 40,000 because we could see, we could grid it in our mind and see that many. And um, they felt, his people from the back felt like we went over 60,000 people. But all I know it was it was too many. Because as you saw in Israel there a week or two ago in that religious festival and somebody slipped and fell and then it was just a stampede and 40-some people died. Yeah. So staying calm in things, no matter what, is is a challenge. And so I've tried to take all the focus off of me walking with God and how I feel about my walk with God. And what I hear about my walk with God from myself and from the enemy. And I try and keep my focus on God's walk with me. God is amazing. The Lord is a deliverer. The Lord is a helper. The Lord is a healer. My Lord is my Savior. He is my soon coming King. It was funny Sunday morning, you know, we're here. um, Was this Sunday Mother's Day? This past Sunday? Yeah. And in that early part, I mentioned that unbelievers right now are not slaves. They're slaves to sin. But they're not slaves. We're slaves in this world, but in the millennium, it's going to reverse. And I lost most of the audience right then. I could have just stopped and taken questions. We could have been here for two hours. What do you mean we're going to be slaves? Because a lot of people think, well, you know, if I don't make it, I'm going to just get through the tribulation. I'm going to slide in there. They're not going to like living in the millennium. It's going to be horrible for the unbeliever. Horrible. They sin, they're judged immediately. Many of them will be executed. (laughs) It's not princess land for those who didn't receive Jesus Christ. It's not the tooth fairy and money under your pillow. It's horrible, horrific. It's a burden. They're slaves the whole time. When you read David... Anything about David in the Old Testament? Do you remember reading through Kings? And and he takes that one group of people and he measures them off and all those ones get executed and these ones he makes chop the wood and carry the water. That's the millennium. For everybody who's not glorified and serving with Jesus Christ, that's the millennium for a thousand years. And they screw up, they're dead. It's just that simple. We got more where you came from, we really don't care. No, zero grace, none. Yeah, yeah, I, that's what I got Sunday morning. <laughs> People are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, that's why today's the day of salvation, not after the tribulation. 
That's why it's now. He shed his blood for all eternity. It just So we have to remind ourselves of these kinds of things. Okay, take us out of the camera. Thanks for joining us. God bless you.